Since the establishment of Sherman and Sterling in 1873, the firm has played a central role in efforts to avert several potential world financial crises. Never has the firm's role been so significant and so critical as in the Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s, a period when the debt of the largest Latin American countries exceeded 300 billion US dollars, over 800 billion at today's valuation, and when the debt owed by these countries to the largest commercial bank lenders far exceeded their capital and reserves. With this crisis threatening the social, political, and financial stability of these countries, as well as the global financial systems, the firm embarked on a decade-long assignment advising the international creditors' committees during the initial phase of restructurings and in the subsequent debt reduction transactions known as Brady Bond Exchanges for many of the Latin American countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Uruguay. In this video, some of the firm's current and retired attorneys describe how Sherman and Sterling's work on these transactions helped the region emerge from the so-called lost decade and explain how the firm's decades of experience in sovereign restructurings have guided its work in subsequent high-profile restructurings, including in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and most recently, Greece. By the early months of 1982, the danger flags were flying. Mexico and then successive uh, other countries admitted that they, they couldn't afford to both service their debts and keep their populations happy at the same time. Officials from more than a hundred of the world's largest banks emerged today from the New York Federal Reserve Bank after meeting to discuss the money Mexico owes those banks, about $80 billion. The problem is that half of it comes due within the next year, and Mexico can't pay it. We have been facing a liquidity problem, a cash problem. It starts out as, as a financial matter, and, but if the country's currency is reduced in value, uh, that means that you'll have a lot of unrest in the country because people just won't have enough to eat. Inflation shot up nearly 100% in 1982 alone. The peso collapsed to one-fifth of its former value, and unemployment climbed to 12%, with another 30% able to find only part-time work. Their debt held by the eight largest American banks amounted to 250% of the bank's capital. If the banks had been forced to write down their loans before they had sufficient capital, it would have wiped that capital out and we would have had a banking crisis. In addition to the American banks, all the other European banks, French, Swiss, Germans, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, English, they also made these loans. So it was an international problem. That meant that we had to have something approaching a creditors committee in every country. Well, the steering committees were generally comprised of banks from different countries around the world, primarily the countries whose banks lent um, significant sums of money to the particular country. Sherman Sterling, from the start, acted as the counsel for the creditors committee in most of the big countries. We had to make sure that all the banks thought that we were representing their interests. And sometimes it took longer to discuss an issue and to thrash it out and get a solution. Uh, but we had to do it, and he had to do it in a, in a cooperative fashion. It's, uh, it requires some statesman's conduct in addition to legal. We had to come up with a structure to take into account the various different currencies, the various different maturities, the various different legal requirements for various uh, different banks. There were syndicated loan agreements, there were single bank agreements, there were agreements in Swiss francs and dollars and yen and Deutschmarks. When one realizes there were 750 creditor banks of Brazil, 500 of Mexico, 350 of Argentina, 
it's obvious there were many challenges to communicate with all banks globally. It was Sherman and Sterling's job to uh, quarterback the legal process. And that was a big job. The, the whole idea was to keep the system going while the banks build up reserves so that if something did go wrong in the end, they would not be bankrupt themselves. The external debt situation is highly political and many of the reforms that the IMF imposed on a country were very unpopular domestically. So when you're negotiating a sovereign debt restructuring, one has to be mindful of the impact it's going to have on the government as well as the citizens of the country. In many of the countries, however, the issue of sovereignty and sovereign immunity is important. It's an emotional term, as I suspect it is in, in all countries. There was one restructure agreement signed up for the Argentine airline, Aerolíneas. The head of the central bank signed it, and when he got off the plane from uh, the IMF meetings, he was arrested for treason uh, because he had given away sovereignty of the country of Argentina. The decision of the court to arrest the central bank president had quite a chilling effect on the restructurings at the time in other countries as well. Fortunately, the court overturned the ruling, and the central bank president was released from prison. One of the other challenges in the restructuring process was once the agreements were finalized, the bankers actually traveled to New York to sign the restructuring agreements. The signings were enormous. We had, uh, we signed the first Brazil um, transaction in the ballroom of the Plaza Hotel. People were told to come at nine in the morning, line up and sign the papers. We had 50 something legal assistants over there working this signing. After the first wave of restructuring, a small uh, secondary market of debt trading uh, began. Initially it was intra-bank, either small banks selling to exit the process or larger banks uh, rebalancing their portfolio. The big banks were the ones that had the, the problem. The smaller banks, for the most part, the bank in Iowa, for example, it, it just said, we're, we're, forget it, we're not going to put up any more money. Uh, if somebody wants to buy our loan, we'll sell it to you at a discount or whatever it is. And they just basically got out of this whole system. As the restructurings progressed, the market increased dramatically. Eventually, the debt trading market grew to about $7 billion in 1986. Around 93, it was $270 billion. And today, I believe the most recent EMTA press uh, release said the debt trading of bank loans and bonds was about $5.5 trillion. It permitted a lot of innovative transactions to occur, uh, innovations like debt equity, swaps, but also to something that at least the conservation community considered the silver lining of the debt crisis, and that was debt for nature. A conservation organization could buy a dollar's worth of debt for 20 cents, take it to the central bank, the central bank might give it 90 cents worth of local currency. For conservation organizations, that was getting a lot of bang for the buck. It was very advantageous uh, for both the conservation community, but the country in that external debt was further reduced, which in turn was invested in conservation projects in that country. The second phase was debt reduction. It became clear that we had to refinance over a much longer period of time. Banks had started to reserve much more heavily on their cross-border loans to sovereigns and were then able to sustain a loss on the debt. At the same time, Secretary Brady proposed um, the Brady transaction. Secretary Brady articulated its principles uh, in the early part of, of 1989, basically saying the time is right for a second phase. So the package was the bank would take its bank loans. It would, it would in effect, surrender the bank loan claims in exchange for bonds collateralized bonds of a reduced principal amount, in some cases, that was called discount bonds, or bearing a concessionary interest rate, but having the same principal amount. Those were called par bonds. The menu of options allowed a bank to choose which of the two worked for them the best. It was really, I think, the beginning of the end of the debt crisis. I mean, the structure for all these Brady deals was, was basically the same. Once, once you went, went over for Mexico, doing it for Argentina and Brazil and the rest of the countries was accepted. And, they, and so and that reduced a lot of principal, certainly eased up on the amount of interest that, that the countries had to pay.
One of the differences in the Argentine Brady transaction was that unlike Mexico, Argentina was $10 billion in arrears on interest. And the Brady transaction dealt with the, the stock of debt, the principal amount of debt owed by a country, not interest. So the challenge in Argentina was, and subsequently in Brazil, was to address uh, the interest arrearages. The whole purpose from 1982 to basically 92 was to get the country back on track, get the, get the uh, banks to get their own reserving system fixed, and stop making loans to on uh, balance of payment loans to countries that can't pay uh, uh, pay them back, and it worked. You know, following the Brady transactions, many of the countries were able to return to the capital markets, and also embark on privatization programs. Huge amount of investment went into public sector utilities that had quite a big impact on sort of improved infrastructure. In 1982, 1983, 1984, 1985, I can tell you with a very straight face, nobody wanted to hold debt instruments from these countries. And now many, many, many investors want to. That's a success story. Having lost the 80s, so to speak, it, it was really critically important to having that be the beginning of the opportunity to grow again. I think international cooperation, the cooperation between the governments, the International Monetary Fund, the, and, and all the governments in Europe and, and Asia, they all work together to solve these problems. And sometimes it was harder than others. And, uh, but in the end, they all got done. Problems that seemed impossible to solve were solved in large part. And I think the experience from that applies equally to some of the problems we've seen recently in Europe, um, but that consensus building is the best way to solve problems. A crisis that is directly comparable to the Latin American crisis, I don't, I don't think we have seen since the Latin American crisis. I think the crisis that has engulfed the Southern European countries, Greece in particular, is a country that is going through a very painful economic and financial and to a large extent social restructuring on the back of a sovereign debt crisis that was very similar to some of the, to the crisis experienced by some countries in Latin America. We wouldn't be where we are today or the last 20 years if we hadn't restructured all of that back then. I think all of us feel very strongly that this is a legacy that was left to us and it's a legacy that we're gonna continue to leave um, to those who come behind us. This is very much what Sherman and Sterling is and we're all part of that continuum. You wouldn't have seen some of them grow stronger on the international stage. You wouldn't have seen millions of people lifted out of poverty over the last 20 years due to the integration of those economies with the rest of the world. I don't think we would have a World Cup in Brazil, for example. These are all signs of increasing integration of, a, of, of an economy into the, into the global economy. Painful as it was for the countries during what's often called the lost decade of the 1980s, it built a foundation for them. And the Mexicos and the Brazils and the Perus and some other countries have taken advantage of that. One of the important um, points to make about the Latin American restructurings is that it wasn't just one person, one country, one bank. It was a group of people working together for the common goal of resolving what was truly an international crisis. I don't know that this average citizen would say, gee, a bank lawyer or, uh, did a great job for us, you know, but the, the, the impact of what we ended up doing do, did help them. I don't know how many times uh, a firm or a group of lawyers or a lawyer gets to, is able to say truthfully that their work uh, resulted in the avoidance of what could have been a disastrous worldwide financial crisis. And I think we can say that.